not uh, without without basically covering up the government uh, disease. So it's very important to have this independent mechanism. And basically, we Jordan here we we rely on. There is no institutional support we can rely on here. All human rights defenders, all lawyers are working individually. Basically, no institutional support is met in Azerbaijan. Emin Hussainov organization, basically, uh, Emin Hussainov left the country. Uh, two directors of his organization, uh, the uh, IRS, uh, one of them has been killed, another one uh, is in jail now. So. Basically, every single NGO that really supports the fields of uh, really supports and really faces, uh, really makes sure that it provides any support to journalists or human rights defense is facing enormous challenges, including the tax charges and so on. And rapporteurs have been speaking about those. And I think it's important uh, that uh, the U.S. Uh, is insisting on access to this country for its rapporteurs. Uh, and uh, it's really important that uh, the country is facing criticism for, uh, for creating all those difficulties to uh, human rights defenders and journalists. And I understand that uh, every international organization is looking for a platform for dialogue with the government. But how do you continue the dialogue if the other party is constantly fighting and basically fighting safety war, is unhappy when the truth is spoken and suppresses any uh, attempt to get the information out? So I think um, the United Nations developed a new strategy of speaking uh, with one of its members, uh, demanding compliance with its uh, obligations to uh, international conventions it has been considered a member of. Uh, we've met with uh, Mr. Frost when he was in Baku, and I know the criticism of the Azerbaijani government to regarding the report Mr. Frost has um, prepared. And this is basically the behavior of Azerbaijani government. They are doing it, uh, well, they are doing it with us, now they are doing it with international firms, with uh, UN And the facts are there. When Mr. Frost was here in Azerbaijan in September, there were anti-referendum rallies uh, staged by the opposition. And on the eve of those rallies, dozens of people have been arrested and were subject to detention and administrative arrest just for preventing people from attending the rallies. And after the rallies, after the rallies, the government used the camera to harass everyone was in the, who was in the state. I know, I personally know a lot of people who had lost their jobs and were subject to detention and arrest after the opposition rally, just for attending it. And, uh, well, it, it doesn't prevent us by Jenny to say that there is a all freedoms are uh, observed in Azerbaijan, people enjoy their freedoms, and uh, all the rights are observed. Azerbaijan government keeps lying to international organization about the situation in the country and keeps preventing independent human rights organizations for, from documenting and from reporting on the cases, uh, using, uh, using sanctions like uh, tax uh, convictions or um, constant harassment of NGOs. Uh, two days ago, we have uh, we had a, we had a problem. We wanted to uh, organize a meeting to, for uh, support to Neymar Zena, and the problem was that we couldn't find any 
in the head venue to hold that in. Basically, there is no single venue in fast school or in the region where you can speak about human rights abuses or you can speak about, you can criticize the government in. All the venues have been taken, uh, even, uh, even the opposition parties, they don't have, uh, most of them don't have offices. Uh, in uh, 2014, the office of the Muslim party had been blasted. Uh, uh, there was an explosion there and the, the building had been seized from the, uh, from the venue. So, uh, so, freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, association, and freedom of speech is violated every day. And uh, it still makes us wonder how come there are so many people who still want to exercise their freedoms despite all these difficulties. And I think it's, um, it's not the, it's not the, um, result of the, it's, a, it, it's not the government we should thank it for. It's basically um, civil society becomes stronger and stronger uh, despite all the problems and uh, even despite, despite the problems, civil society still continues speaking out abroad or inside the country. And I think it's important that the institutions uh, like the United Nations support this remainder of the civil society in the country because uh, then you will have stronger problem in this country. Uh, civil society here in Azerbaijan is very peaceful. Uh, even there is no radical, even, even in opposition, you don't see any radical parties here. So uh, all the all the calls are very peaceful, and uh, it's all you you see the most law-abiding civil society in the world in this country, and still they are facing the problem. Khadija, and imagine what happened. Khadija, yes. I'm awfully sorry. I really want to give you and the panelists an opportunity to engage on the Q and A. So I'm really hoping you're going to be able to stay with us. And I'm terribly sorry for interrupting. It's just time we have. We're going to be. We're going to be cut off. Yeah, of course, please, please. I mean, uh, if the if the civic institutions here, civil society, will not be supported, and if the government doesn't stop these abuses, there is a good chance that there are more radical people in the country who don't. Uh, get, who don't get uh, the peaceful means as a solution will come up and uh, try to do something. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khadija. And to avoid any radical in here, we have to support peaceful and meaningful civil society. Thank you so much, Khadija. I hope you can stay with us. Gulnara, could I turn to you now, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. So I think I am now put in a very hot seat because I have to speak after all other speakers have covered the subject so perfectly. And I think we all agree that what we see in Azerbaijan is a frantic uh, continued crackdown on fundamental universal rights and freedoms. I just wanted to thank Special Rapporteur Force for his excellent report, which I fully endorse. And uh, I especially want to thank you for mentioning impunity, because impunity is a big issue in Azerbaijan. And not everyone, even in this house, speak uh, about Azerbaijan as a country with a high record of impunity. I just want to give you several figures. Last year, in 2016, there were 33 physical attacks against media workers and journalists. That's just one figure. And last week we celebrated, marked uh, 12th anniversary of the murder of a very high profile investigative journalist, Elmar Husseinov, 
who, whose case Emin also mentioned, who was shot dead in 2005, 12 years back, and his murder remains unsolved. And he was a high critic of, of the government. He was very, very critical of the government. This is just one example. Then another example that in, I think that was in November 2015, that UN Committee Against Torture issued observations and recommendations as part of their report on Azerbaijan. And then in that very report, they identified that they are deeply concerned by consistent and numerous allegations of ill treatment uh, that a number of human rights defenders and journalists face in Azerbaijan. And I think I want to go back to the case of that very handsome, very energetic young guy. And his photo is on the wall, Mehmad Hussein, who is currently behind bars uh, on, on defamation charges. And he's behind bars, according to the judge, he defamed authorities when he presented the credible evidence that he was tortured while in police custody. Mehman Hussein was examined by uh, independent doctors, uh, which was sent by Irish organization Frontline Defenders, and we have that report, and it clearly indicates that he was ill-treated, at least ill-treated while in police custody. So he is behind bars exactly for claiming the torture. And that's just one example how there is no follow-up on those wonderful reports, because I fully agree with that observations uh, of uh, UN Committee Against Torture, but there is a need for a mechanism to follow up. And also there is a need for better coordination between UN agencies, like between UNDP, which supports a lot of uh, programs in Azerbaijan implemented also in cooperation with Azerbaijani government. And there is uh, virtually no coordination between UNDP in country and human rights groups in country. And also be amongst the UN agencies, there is, there is a need for better coordination between UN Human Rights Council, UNDP, UNESCO, and all the other institutions. And I think that's my personal opinion. For this to happen, there is probably a need for a special rapporteur on Azerbaijan who would be there to inform on a constant basis. And I don't want to talk more because I think that we also need to give time for our audience to reflect and we have Nejmin who is waiting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gulnara. Now, Nejmin, thank you. Um, thanks for the speakers for me for giving a bright overview of what has been happening in Azerbaijan in, in last years. And I will also want to make some final notes with the emphasis, emphasis on, on the environment for youth activism in Azerbaijan. So, after the release of high-profile political prisoners uh, last year, the government of Azerbaijan tried to create an illusion that uh, the situation is going to be better, they, they are going to improve the human rights situation, and they are going to be more open and more democratic. But what we have observed is that the, the, the situation is going to be even worse. Um, the government of Azerbaijan released high-profile political prisoners because they wanted to have uh, financial assistance because they, have, they are facing economical challenges. But on the other hand, they cannot, they cannot free the civil society, they cannot free the media, they cannot free the political prisoners because they see civil society as a threat for their existence. So uh, the real indicator of the real human rights situation in Azerbaijan is the number of political prisoners. Local human rights defenders count more than 150 political prisoners. Among them, there are, there are polit politicians, bloggers, journalists, youth activists, opposition party members, and religious, religious activists. And almost all of them are, uh, have been subject to threats, pressures, and intimidation in prison. And another issue I, uh, I would like to mention is, uh, is the, the, the Situ uh, conditions for the youth, youth activists who want to involve in socio-political processes. I am representing NIDA Civic Movement, which is the, I would say, only uh, independent and progressive and critical youth movement in Azerbaijan. That's why NIDA has been one of the main targets of the, of the government. So uh, since 2013, when NIDA uh, in involved in organization of 
peaceful protests, mass peaceful protests. The government started to imprison, uh, to harass, to, to persecute the members of NIDA. Uh, in last four years, 13 members of NIDA civic movement have been arrested, and five of them still remain behind bars. Among them, there is Ilchin Rustamzada, who was imprisoned in 2013 March, and he, he is still behind bars. It, it has been four years. And another political prisoner that I would like to mention here is Ilgar Mamadov, who has been uh, arrested in 2013, 2012, and he he is still behind bars. He was he was a real alternative for the government. He was running, he was going to run for presidential elections in 2013, and the government basically arrested him to prevent him to, for running from running to parliamentary election, uh, presidential elections. And he is still behind bars, uh, uh, even though there is a European Court judgment that he he must be released. And uh, another pressing issue is the NGO environment in the country that the government of Azerbaijan literally blocks the activities of every, every NGO, especially in the f working in the fields of human rights, transparency, rule of law, democracy, and, and so on. And uh, the, the government basically used two ways to, to block activities of NGOs. Basically, they, throughout the time, they, they amended the NGO law in more and more restrictive way. So now, basically, it is um, impossible to receive financial assistance, it's impossible to run any activities. And they, they also, another way they used is imprisoning the key civil society figures, key, key um, NGO leaders in the country. So uh, the, the, they, recently they started to use travel bans, I mean, uh, for those who have been released uh, from prison uh, after being arrested on political grounds. Khadija Ismail and uh, Intigam Aliyev, who is my father, is also subject to this travel ban. And not only travel ban, they were released conditionally, so it means that they cannot hold any public office, they cannot con continue their uh, activities. So uh, this, uh, I think, sum up, sums up the, the, the real situation of the human rights in the country. And we, what we think is that uh, this all happened throughout these years because there have not been any adequate reaction by the international community especially from UN, especially from Council of Europe and OCE and other international inst European institutions. So uh, w the, the report by uh, Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defender is a solid ground that UN can take action against, against the human rights violations in Azerbaijan. So we here encourage uh, UN to create new mechanisms to uh, stop ongoing oppression in the country. Well, thank you very much, Najmin. Um, thank you all, panelists, for an extremely insightful and illuminating uh, session. Um, we have, obviously, a large number of people in the room, and I'm hoping that many of you will have questions. We have a relatively limited time. Um, but before I open the floor um, for questions and comments, um, I recognize the ambassador of Azerbaijan in the room, and I'd like to give you the opportunity and if you'd like to comment, so please, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you so much, Madam Chairperson. Uh, before saying anything at this meeting, I would like to know if you are having your uh, rules of procedure in which way would you like them to reflect, either it's, uh, asking questions or making comments. Because in the first case, then I would have a long list of questions if you want uh, to make a comment, I would like to know how many minutes in uh, accordance to your practice you are going to give me. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. As, as we've recognized, it's now 25. So we have 25 minutes. We'd like to have a very interactive discussion. That's the ambition and the goal. So if you could limit your comments or questions, I leave that completely in your hands to a f just a very few minutes, because then I'm going to have to move on. So thank you. Five, five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Seven yes. Minutes. Five. No. Five minutes would five, give five us minutes. enough space. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chairperson. Well, first of all, I would like to welcome you the constant interest of your country to the human rights situation in Azerbaijan. And uh, I'm, I'm very flattered by your remark that the situation in Azerbaijan is very important for the whole world. Though I would like to, uh, though I would think that there are many more important issues around the world, life and death issues, rather than the 
uh, gathering of several persons out, uh, who live outside Azerbaijan and have the liberty to talk about Azerbaijan. And now, uh, what I'm amazed with is the, uh, the very special, um, very special well, composition of this panel. We have here the distinguished UN special rapporteurs and we have people who claim to know something about my country, though they are not in the country for whatever, whatever reasons. And each of them have their own personal account with this country and have their own personal story and grievances with the government and the people of Azerbaijan. I will start with uh, distinguished uh, Michel Post. Uh, several days ago his report was presented. Uh, you know the position of the government of Azerbaijan. Uh, we value the importance of the report. However, as, uh, uh, when it comes to the substance of the report, our position is that it is biased, it is one-sided, and that we reject this report. The official version of our, of our intervention is on the ex uh, external. Uh, the main uh, point of criticism was that the views of the government of Azerbaijan have never been reflected in this report. And uh, that's why, despite the fact that, as uh, Mr. Frost himself said, meetings were uh, organized. Another serious point is that uh, in the selecting uh, the interlocutors in Baku, the human rights defenders, uh, distinguished Mr. Cross uh, did not wish, or rather the lack of time, to meddle with a very important part of the human rights defenders, and these are the human rights defenders defending the right of one million refugees in Azerbaijan. And, uh, and uh, I would like to assure you that despite everything that these young black teenagers and students were talking here, we really have a problem, and this is the problem number one for the whole country, for the government, and uh, for, for the people of Azerbaijan. And this is the continued violations of the one million, uh, of the human rights of one million of refugees and IDPs. And all of these, all, all of these presenters have never touched uh, that, that issue because it goes against the political agenda of theirs and of those who are sponsoring their activities. Now, with regard to distinguished Mr. Maina Kiyaya, uh, no, no comments. The invitation, as you know, has been issued to you. Last year, you postponed your visit to 2017. We are looking forward to your start to propose uh, new dates for your, for your visit. Uh, Emil Hussein. Well, Emil Hussein, uh, uh, well, we um, uh, spoke uh, at a similar event last year. Nothing has changed in the sense that this person has been lying last year about the fact that uh, he allegedly was, uh, that, that the government of Azerbaijan allegedly stripped him of, uh, of his uh, citizenship, and then after my question, it happened so that he himself wrote, the, the, uh, wrote an appeal, and he has been lying again uh, today. So, uh, his comments about the... Um, Ambassador, about Ambassador, I'm awfully sorry to interrupt you, yes. but I wonder... Yes. Yeah, just, I, I wonder if we could avoid personal comments, uh, personal criticisms. I, for one, as the moderator of this panel, would be very obliged to you. Thank you. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so his brother, his brother was arrested on a very specific um, uh, charges. There was a court investigation, and, uh, and the court decided that his acts constitute a crime. Physical and juridical persons, as you know, have the right to go, to go further. Uh, I uh, read in the internet all the reports who were absolutely the same. I mean, uh, somebody wrote it and uh, dozens were copying. Uh, the expressions like he was put into an identified car by an identified persons who took him to an identified location. Come on, sort of a James Bond story. Yeah, but then, uh, then uh, trying to uh, inflate uh, the status, the top political blow. Which, which, he is, uh, which he is not. He is not a blogger, but he is a photographer. He is not top, but he is one of the thousands. And as regards uh, whether he is political or a fashion or economic or whatever, that's the, the matter of taste. His real tragedy is that uh, this is a youngster who immediately after graduation of secondary school, instead of getting to university and to studying, uh, to getting knowledge, he was sitting in the corridors of his brothers uh, office, uh, which is called the Institute, so it's represented by one or two persons. And this is how he spent his time. This poor guy is a typical representative of a Facebook generation to whom the real world and the vision of the world is shrinked to the size of, of his smartphone screen. And this is, uh, this is actually what this uh, young man is. is. So, now, and so trying to say that he is the leading blogger in Azerbaijan, of course, it's uh, out of scale. Uh, now, uh, this is Khadija Ismail, who is now on the screen. 
Ambassador, I'm sorry again to interrupt. I'm sure you'll forgive me. Um, we now have ex we've used up the five minutes, and uh, since we're we're now you know tight for time. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to say that you have used up your five minutes already. So we're going to move on now to questions and answers from the floor. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thank you also for, for asking me how long that how long you had because that really has helped me to chair the panel. So we've used up the five minutes, and now I'd like to open the floor. But anybody who has a question or a comment to make, could you introduce yourself so let us know who you are um, before you make your comment or ask a question? Thank you. Please. My name is Chopra Nozabigoni from Kyrgyzstan. I'm a journalist and. So my question is to Mr. Michel Forst. First of all, you mentioned that you meet with prisoners in Azerbaijan. Could you tell us more uh, with whom you met and in what conditions they live? Do they have access to medical assistance or lawyers? And then the second, second question is, um, what is your expectations from your report? We heard what Ambassador said here, and we know that Azerbaijan has higher diplomacy to greet delegations, to to let them come, but the, then there is nothing ha happens usually. So, what is your ex ex expectations, and what mechanisms you see to to push and to follow up this effort? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take a few questions, um, if there are, and I hope there are. Thank you. John. Sure. John Fisher from Human Rights Watch, and thank you very much, Ambassador, and to, to all the panelists uh, for this opportunity to, to reflect further on the situation in, in Azerbaijan, which is very much appreciated to be the report of the, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, which I think reinforced what, uh, what many of us uh, had, had concerns about in terms of the, the closing civil society space and the, the lack of progress, unfortunately, with, within the country. Um, I was disappointed to, to hear the ambassador say that, you know, are there more important issues that we, we could and should be talking about? Because for those people who are, are wrongfully detained, who are in prison, who are unable to travel, for them it is their lives, and of course they are very important issues. And I was also, of course, the, uh, the delegation slipped up, but disappointed at the, the lack of self-reflection, I think, in, in their comments. I think we recognize that, that no state is perfect, that everybody um, can and should improve their, their human rights record. But we, what we do look for from states uh, here at the, at the UN, at the Human Rights Council, is some acknowledgement uh, that there are challenges and some willingness to, to address those challenges. What we heard instead was a, a series of, essentially, personal attacks on, on each of the panelists, which I think itself is reflective of the, uh, the approach of the government to, to the situation of human rights defenders. Um, the, uh, the delegation also said that you know, there were those who hadn't visited the country and sought to pronounce. Human Rights Watch, of course, has visited the country, has, uh, has researched the situation there, but doesn't now have access. So the delegation is keen to ensure people are able to come to the country and report in their view more accurately, then we would certainly encourage them to allow that access and to lift travel bans on, uh, on their own civil society representatives. I guess the question now is what, what can be done about the situation? Um, and I think uh, what we've heard and seen today, both from the panelists and from the delegation, reinforces our own view that there is a need for continued scrutiny by the Human Rights Council of the human rights situation, that only with that kind of scrutiny, only with that, that kind of uh, international engagement uh, will uh, the government hopefully take the message seriously that they need to, to address the situation for um, uh, for their own civil society and human rights defenders in the country, and, and we owe them no less. So I guess it's a, a comment more than a question, but our appreciation and, uh, and, a, and appeal for all of us to keep up the, the scrutiny and to, to look towards future sessions of the Council to see what more we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Michel, maybe you'd like to answer this uh, first question. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. 
uh, yes, I, I did in fact meet with uh, with uh, uh, Imal's defenders more than with political activists, I would say. And uh, to be honest, uh, we uh, put forward a list of 12 people that, that I wanted to meet, and uh, there was no restriction at all to meet with, with the, 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 the 12, in fact. Huh? We had the possibility to meet with them without any restriction uh, from, from, from the government. Uh, uh, many of them said that uh, the condition of detention were uh, difficult, uh, sometimes uh, more than difficult for, for them. Uh, many of them said that they were expecting to be released or to be uh, at least uh, to see their conditions being uh, improved uh, uh, with my visit. Uh, that's something that I want to follow up. Uh, on my expectations, I must say that uh, if you look at my report, you will see a number of co concrete recommendations. Uh, that are not only addressed to the uh, to the government of Azerbaijan, but also to the international community, uh, as well as to civil society, uh, to the ombudsperson, to, um, to, to Azerbaijan. So there's a, a set of recommendations to many stakeholders, uh, and I think that uh, a conjunction of the uh, all those recommendations could be a, uh, an asset to improve the situation of defenders. Um, I made also concrete proposals to Azerbaijan, that is to uh, uh, to have a follow-up visit. Um, and we discussed with the uh, authorities the possibility for me to come back uh, after a couple of, uh, of, uh, of months. I, I made a proposal also to establish a, a sort of committee uh, uh, by which uh, there would be uh, a number of uh, organizations, including the uh, international community, uh, to do the follow-up uh, to, my, to my recommendations. Uh, and I do hope, uh, uh, despite the uh, strong attacks uh, on, my, on my report, that I would have the possibility uh, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, talk to the government. And lastly, I must say that uh, international pressure uh, is also my expectations uh, uh, from the uh, ambassadors, from the international community, but also from uh, initiatives like the uh, Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, uh, which is for me a good way to push uh, Azerbaijan to be more uh, effective in the protection of human rights defenders. Right. Thank you, Michel. Yes, please, Renata. Thank you. Thank you. similar event <coughs> last year, and I must only say that I'm very, very sorry that, the, uh, that we have to respond from the ambassador in the way in which we have received, because the ambassador had just newly arrived last year after our event, and uh, we had engaged in a dialogue, and I'm very, very sorry that this, and he actually had also said that he was interested in a new dialogue. And so I'm all the more sorry that we cannot really engage in a dialogue, rather in a text only and in not recognition of anything. So this was just a comment. Thank you. Well, yes, thanks. Great, Philip. Um, Phil Lynch from IFHR. Uh, I guess a, a one comment and, and a question. Um, the comment really is, the need for us when thinking about cooperation to think in substantive and not formal or ritualistic terms and um, I, I guess it's you know not just pertinent to Azerbaijan but an institutional challenge to try and develop indicators and a methodology to actually assess co the, the, the good faith um, and, and the substance of, of cooperation um, uh, which should be relevant considerations in for example questions as to um, whether a, a, a a state is worthy of election to the Human Rights Council and so on. Um, my, my question is, um, at what point is the threshold reached for a resolution rather than a joint statement? Okay, that's a, I'm sorry. There's a practical question, um, which as moderator, I will pass to the rest of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> We'd well, we we'll expect you to answer that one. Yeah, I had a suspicion it might come in my direction. I yeah. mean, we obviously are very committed to this issue, evidenced by the fact that I'm here today. And uh, I was very gratified to hear reference to the fact um, of uh, our uh, NGO engagement where it really can matter and does matter. Um, we are not losing sight of this issue. Uh, we intend to continue 
to have our leadership role, but this is not specifically answering the question, which, as Phil will know, I am simply not going to answer. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a question, as with every issue in the Human Rights Council, timing is important, um, and it's not something that a state in this circumstance will do on its own. So we see our responsibility to continue to be committed to this issue, to continue to work with other states, to continue to raise our voice on the matter and to try to engage with other states, to, to, to bring other states on board to lead forward on this matter. Um, a joint statement is, I think, a very in effective tool. It certainly um, has, in a number of instances, had a significant effect in the Council. It seems uh, to many as low bar uh, goal, but of course, first of all, um, a joint statement to resonate needs to have sufficient support from key member states, indeed from member states full stop. And that is a very practical but very real and important issue that needs to be addressed. What one doesn't want to do is to bring forward a joint statement or indeed a resolution at a time where you simply don't anticipate that you're going to get the sort of support from states that you would want to have. And in that way, if you time it wrong, wrongly, uh, you can set the whole clock back. And so timing is very critical. So that, this is the reason why I think it would be both intemperate and irresponsible of me to answer the question more directly than I have. Thank you. So, yes, please. Thanks very much. My name's Annick Lucieves. I'm with the Delegation of Canada. Thank you so much uh, to all the panelists uh, for your uh, very sobering uh, presentation on the situation in Azerbaijan. Um, just a question regarding uh, what the Ambassador uh, of Azerbaijan mentioned, which is that um, perhaps the views of HRD uh, human rights defenders working on human, uh, refugee issues were not taken into account. Just a question in terms of whether um, human rights defenders working in specific areas are being targeted, or is it, you know, quite a, a blanket uh, approach um, to the um, uh, restrictive environment? Thank you. Forgive me. Who would like to respond? Please, I mean. It's, oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Azerbaijan government always says for, we have one million refugees. I'm always repeated, yes, we have military conflict with our neighbor, with Armenia, we have one million refugees. We always, always spoke about these problems. And my brothers, he prepared dozens of reportages mm -hmm. about how this government make violations to refugee rights. You don't give electricity, don't give social support enough to these people. Government, yes, when government needed, government says so we are not patriots. We are blame our motherland. We are never do this. We always say about problems of refugees too. We always support rights of these people. But government always manipulated with facts, and that's how the ambassador successfully, unsuccessfully tried to manipulate it. He said, he said, as Mehman worked in my organization after school as a like slave. But maybe ambassador don't know Mehman have bachelor degree, finance, if Baku State Economic University successfully finished this university. He want to continue his education. But Minister of Internal Affairs removed his ID and passport from national data system. He's not able to go to continue his study in master's degree in Azerbaijan in, or in outside. Again, I'm totally disagree with Mr. Ambassador, and we always open with spoke with Azerbaijan government here or in, in Azerbaijan, but government always ignore us. And again, to return to your questions. All people, which is spoke about real problem, it doesn't matter. This problem is freedom of expression with rights of refugees in Azerbaijan, <coughs> these people have problems. It's not a specific issue. But all civil society, including organizations which is work with 
IDPs, which is work with free expression, with uh, transparency, accountability of government, even uh, women's rights and children's rights. If you are independent NGO, you have a problem. If you are Gongo and you are very loyal and you are always able to agree with government position, yeah, government give less chances to operate it. But if you, you are independent NGO, which is criticizing government, including about rights of the refugees, which is my brother, is like human rights defender, but it's not only free expression advocate, it's also going and meet with these refugees, with victims of the war, with family members, with soldier fathers and mothers, which is, don't have any support by this government, and he shows this problem, and that's why he is isolated. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious that Khadija has been looking to speak, and um, I'm sorry, Khadija, that I, I omitted to look to my right, but we're very, very uh, conscious of, of you being there. So please. And sorry, 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 Khadija. Khad sorry, Khadija, before you say a thing, we have people at the door trying to get in, so I'm really sorry we're under usual thing in Geneva, too Amen. much time pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Ambassador for everything in his intervention. Unfortunately, I couldn't hear my part of the uh, personal attack. Uh, would, would be happy to continue dialogue with, without uh, any enemies. With uh, outside of the intervention. Well, as the Bahraini government, we say that we are uh, not defending refugees. That's not true. That's not true. And uh, I think the conversation should stop here. here saying that uh, occupation of Azerbaijani land and violation of uh, rights of uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees does not justify Azerbaijani government's actions against human rights and democracy in the country. And uh, period. That, that's where this conversation ends. And also, Azerbaijani government, we don't, uh, we don't put difference between intelligent and non-intelligent uh, political prisoners and the Azerbaijani government doesn't do so as well. Because we know that intellectual Ilgar Mamada, who is the, uh, who is, who has excellent background, educational and political background, is also in prison and he, and he was subject to physical violence and his two teeth have been broken by the prison uh, deputy chief. So, uh, so, so, this is not the conversation we want to hear. We want to hear a uh, um, constructive dialogue between the government and human rights defenders when the government would say, okay, we will see what we can do and let's try to make sure that the government goes further in a better direction. But we don't hear that and that's why I think that the international organization should develop a new strategy of building a new kind of dialogue where Azerbaijani government will be responsible for what it said and will be held responsible for what it does inside the country. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think that's a really good note to end on. So Khadija, thank you again. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, the audience, for your attentiveness and following this issue so closely. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, an honor to be here. So thank you again. Thank you.